Let me maybe start with an example. We know more and more growers who are taking their vegetable land out of production to grow three or four years of hay. Now, hay isn't really a high-value crop relative to vegetables. And in some cases, these growers are simply giving the hay away free to someone who will make it. But the payback is when they bring the land back into production, the soil quality has improved, the weed pressure has gone way down, and they have this built-in buffer for the rotation. Okay, you're out of vegetables three years, all of a sudden it makes it so much easier uh, to plan your crops. And we know some growers who have found this so effective that they've actually leased or purchased more land just to take advantage of this. Our approach to bioextensive market gardening is a little different. We take half of the market garden out of production each year so that we can take advantage of annual cover crops and bear fallow periods. In the first part of our slide presentation, we'll be looking at what I think of as sort of foundational farm practices, uh, cover cropping, bear fallow, compost applications, and crop rotation, and looking at how this land extensive approach uh, can make these uh, practices easier to implement and more effective. The second part, we'll look at sort of uh, less necessary practices, you might say, add-ons uh, such as mulching, reduced tillage, and season extension. But before we get into the details, we thought you might want to know how we came up with this approach. Uh, particularly when we were getting started back in the 80s, uh, this wasn't very typical. The emphasis was much more on intensive production. And I think we could say, looking back, that there's three reasons uh, we ended up with this approach. One was our location. The other was our goals for the farm. And then also our previous farming experience. And one of our initial goals is we wanted to minimize debt as much as possible. So we chose to locate an area where land prices were relatively inexpensive. We ended up in Lycoming County. It's in north central Pennsylvania. It's not prime uh, vegetable soils. It's not a prime climate for vegetable production. And we don't have, you know, a lot of great markets. But the land was cheap and we could use it as a resource. We didn't have to put every inch of it into production. Another goal that we had is we wanted to keep our farm a two-person operation, and we also wanted to minimize off-farm inputs as much as possible. So we thought if we could use the land to build up fertility and reduce weed pressure, we would not have to rely on paid labor or purchase inputs. But we probably would never have thought of going this way if it wasn't for the fact that we had already worked on land extensive farms. We really are a product of our experience. Uh, I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey and had no ag agricultural background at all and had the opportunity to work on a, a very large medicinal herb farm in the state of Washington. And I was there for six years and became a partner in that business. And one of the things that was drummed into me was the importance of weed control. And this wasn't just weeding the crop itself, but it was looking at the farm as a whole. And so it was bringing land into production. We would foul the land to get rid of quack grass. Uh, we would do a lot of rotations um, so that crops weren't in year after year, so we could um, break up uh, weed cycles. And we did a lot of cover cropping to bring, uh, bring the soil back and um, good tilth. So um, we brought those ideas with us. The other aspect is at that time, this is in 1976 here, um, most of vegetable production in the Northwest was all 32 inch rows. You didn't see bed systems that are the norm now. So when we came to our farm, we went with 32 inch rows because that's what we knew. You know, like Ann, I didn't grow up farming either. My first exposure to farming was attending a farm camp in Vermont. Um, I wasn't really that much into the camp side of it, but I just loved the farming. And every moment after that, I spent working on farms or living in rural areas. That included a year on a dairy farm in Norway, 
a couple of summers uh, working on plain farms in Lancaster County. And then I also, after graduating from school, uh, hitchhiked my way across the country working on farms of all types and sizes. I just wanted to see it all, learn as much as possible about different ways of approaching it. It, it tended to be mainly uh, livestock and field crop farms, so it was a lot of row cropping, hay production, and small grains. And about a year into the journey, I ended up at a large medicinal herb farm in the state of Washington and was hired uh, to join a crew of Mexicans weeding a 40-acre field of peppermint. One of my jobs was the crew boss for this crew of Mexicans. And these guys were professionals. They knew what they you know, were doing. They taught me so much over those times. And oftentimes, we would have people wanting to come and visit this beautiful herb farm and want to help us out in the gardens. You know, you know, the nice raised beds, and there's just this idyllic situation, not realizing they're coming to 40 acres of peppermint, half-mile long rows, and that's what you did, walked back and forth, and you weeded. Um, and so the, the general rule was that we would allow the visitors to help us in the fields, but we would mark their row because oftentimes they weren't the best workers in the world. So when they left and we thanked them, we would come back the next day and do their row over again. <laughs> so Eric was with the weeding crew, and at the end of the day, one of the guys comes up to me and he says, El gringo es bien trabajador, no sacates. <laughs> Which means, you know, hey, the white guy, uh, he's a good worker, there aren't any weeds in his row. <laughs> So I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> I had no idea about ad surveillance system, but uh, I realized I must have done okay because at the end of the growing season, I married the boss. And as long as he remembers his boss, <laughs> everything goes just fine. <laughs> and we've been married for 30 years, so I guess he knows his boss. <laughs> At any rate, after getting married, we decided we wanted to move back to the Northeast to be a little closer to our families. And we ended up on this farm in, in dairy country. And whenever we had the opportunity, we liked to talk to the second and third generation dairy farmers and you know, ask them, how did they control the weeds before the advent of herbicides? How did they maintain the fertility in their land without chemical fertilizers? How did they get all the work done without tractors? And inevitably, the conversation always came back to the cows rotation. This is a livestock uh, rotation uh, comprised of corn, oats, wheat, and sod. Cows, for short. And I won't bore you with the details, but some of the sort of fundamental features of this rotation is you're always uh, alternating between soil building crops and heavy feeders. You're using small grain crops as soil building cover crops. And also what really caught our attention was the idea of the summer fallow. Okay, after the harvest of oats in July and before planting wheat in the fall was a period of tillage used uh, to de deplete uh, the weeds in the soil. In our area, it was particularly focused on quackgrass, which is a, a prevalent perennial weed, but it was effective for other weeds as well. And we took that idea and we said, well, maybe we could use a fallow year before our production modeled on the same idea. But instead of using small grains to harvest, we just use cover crops. So we have a big cover crop in the spring, a period of tillage for weed control, and another big cover crop in the fall. And I think with that introduction, maybe we should get into the slides and see how we actually go about doing it. This slide gives you a pretty good idea of what the bioextensive market garden looks like in the middle of the summer. You can see how the fields alternate between cash crops and fallow lands. And you're probably wondering, why would we take so much land out of production? I mean, this is 50% of 
of the market garden. Well, one reason is this provides us with so much more time and space for cover cropping. To put it the other way around, we uh, just found that when we were growing vegetables year after year, we weren't doing a very good job with the cover crops. For instance, the harvest of many of our vegetables extends late into the fall. With our short growing season, that barely gave us enough time to get a cover crop of rye established before winter. This might provide a minimum of soil cover, but if we had to turn the rye under first thing the next spring to get ready for planting early vegetables, well, the rye really didn't have the opportunity to put on much top growth or root mass. In fact, we came across some research that indicated that the tillage required for establishing the rye and then turning it under at this stage could actually burn up more soil organic matter than is contributed by the cover crop. That was kind of sobering news for us. Um, yes, if we let the cover crop get big enough to provide a net gain in soil organic matter, well, then we lose our opportunity to grow spring vegetables. Also, as beginner farmers, this looked really daunting to deal with all this biomass. I mean, how are we going to turn this under, make a nice seed bed, and not create a nitrogen tie-up from overloading the soil with too much carbon? Once we started taking land out of production, all of these challenges just seemed to disappear. We could allow the cover crops to get as big as we wanted, and then there was no time pressure to turn it under and create, create a seed bed because the vegetables would not be planted until the following year. This also eliminated the concern uh, with nitrogen tie-up. But probably the biggest advantage of taking the land out of production for a whole year is we had plenty of time to grow a second substantial cover crop. In this case, uh, oats and peas plant at the beginning of August. Going bioextensive makes it possible to grow two substantial cover crops before every cash crop. When planted in early August, spring annuals like oats and peas put a lot of top growth on in the fall, and then they die back over winter, creating a nice mulch that protects the soil. And because the root system is already dead, these winter-killed cover crops are very easy to incorporate in the spring, allowing you to get in and get the earliest planted cash crops planted on schedule. This fallow system um, allows us to maximize the growth of the cover crop even before the earliest spring plantings. The fallow year also allows us to maximize the root development of overwintering cover crops. For example, this uh, rye and hairy vetch was planted the second week of August and you can see how much top growth it's already put on even before the leaves have started to change color in the fall. This is a much different scenario than just trying to slip in a cover crop after the harvest of fall vegetables. What you don't see is the tremendous root growth underground. These overwintering cover crops are like an iceberg, putting most of their energy into root development at this time of year. So even if we have to turn under the overwintering cover crops early the next spring before they've had a chance to put on much top growth, that Ryan Harry vetch has already accomplished a significant amount of soil building underground. These uh, crops, like these storage potatoes, seem to appreciate the improved soil structure and the fertility. Now keep in mind that we're growing not just one, but two significant cover crops before each cash crop. This alternating fallow year system also allows us to take advantage of long-term cover crop mixes. And one of the combos that we've really grown to like is this mix of sorghum Sudan grass and medium red clover planted around the middle of June. The heat-loving sorghum Sudan grass really takes off with the hot weather. It can produce a tremendous amount of biomass. In fact, we usually need to mow the sorghum Sudan grass two or three times over the course of the summer to keep the residues somewhat manageable and succulent. Otherwise, it can grow over 10 feet tall and get as tough as corn stalks. 
Research conducted in New York shows that when you mow this drought harvey cover crop at this stage, it encourages it to put its roots deeper in the soil, alleviating compaction. So in this way, we can use the fallow year cover crops to do the deep tillage for us. This is what the fallow field looks like in the fall after mowing the sorghum sudan grass a few times and the final regrowth has frost killed. Meanwhile, the clover in the understory has completely filled in, creating a nice weed competitive uh, cover crop uh, to hold the soil over winter. The following spring, this legume produces a fair amount of high nitrogen material before turning it under in May. This is a nice balance to all of the high carbon material produced by the sorghum sudan grass the previous summer. So nitrogen tie-up isn't a problem. To the contrary, this combination seems to provide plenty of fertility for heavy, seed, heavy feeding crops planted, planted out midsummer. Now, as you probably know, these brassicas will stay in the ground almost up to the onset of uh, winter. And there won't be an opportunity to plant a soil building cover crop. But we are not really that concerned because we know the whole next year will be out of production. We'll have plenty of time uh, to use the cover crops for soil building. Taking 50% of the market garden out of production not only facilitates cover cropping, it also makes manure and compost management much easier. Uh, that's because we can take care of these inputs a full year ahead of production rather than trying to just deal with it right before we're planting the vegetables. For example, if um, we want to use our small flock of laying hens to debug and fertilize the market garden, we can pasture the hens on a fallow field. In this way, we can easily meet the National Organic Program's guidelines uh, because we're applying that manure a full year ahead. Our primary source of fertility is the manure generated by our workhorses and then it's con then composted by the uh, pigs. Although the hogs produce a really nice quality compost, it doesn't meet the NOP guidelines. Uh, but that isn't a problem when we apply the hog composted manure to the um, fallow fields. In this case, we're applying that compost in between two cover crops in preparation for our early planted cash crops of onions, like you see in the background. Applying the compost to the fallow lands a full year before production also means we don't have to fool with it in the spring when the ground is often uh, too wet to get out there with a manure spreader and time is a precious resource as it is. In addition, when we apply the compost now, it allows it to stimulate the root growth and the top growth of the fall cover crop of field peas. In this way, we can amplify the soil building effect of a limited supply of compost. In the process, we've been able to maintain the fertility of our six and a half acre market garden with the manure from just four workhorses. To think of it a different way, if we were to rely on manure or compost alone to maintain good conditions for vegetables, we would have to apply it at much higher rates. Over time, that could lead to nutrient excesses or imbalances. But this hasn't been an issue for us when we're using relatively modest applications of compost to grow lots of cover crops. Our typical application rate in recent years has been six to eight yards to the acre. That's about four of these small spreader loads covering an acre of ground. This light application rate virtually disappears when it's applied into an overwintering cover crop like this rye and vetch in the spring. And again, by applying it now, we can meet the NOP guidelines for vegetables that will be planted midsummer. In addition, again, the compost will enhance the overall growth of the overwintering cover crop. Now you're probably wondering, how are we ever going to plant into all of this residue? But keep in mind, we're disking down this rye and hairy vetch the third week of May, and we aren't going to be planting into this field until the middle of July. So that gives us plenty of time to work the surface of the soil, and a lot of that residue will be broken down. 
Digging into the soil at planting time, you can see a lot of that residue is broken down into small little pieces. We have really nice crumb structure and plenty of moisture for direct seeding and transplanting. Here's so, here are some of our fall crops after the dish down rye and hairy vetch and that light application of compost that was applied way back in April. The bioextensive system can facilitate weed management just like it simplifies the management of the cover crops and compost. By way of evidence, we never did any hand weeding in these rows of fall carrots and brassicas. The key to achieving this type of low weed pressure is taking half of the market garden out of production each year to focus on proactive weed management. Specifically, we're using strategic bare fallow periods between the fallow year cover crops. The first step is incorporating the cover crops before any weeds that are growing in them have a chance to set seed. Then we like to settle the soil, create a firm moist seed bed to intentionally germinate annual weed seeds. As soon as these weeds have sprouted, then we use shallow cultivation like the spring tooth harrow to kill the weeds while they're small and vulnerable. As soon as they've died, then we go back over the field, say with a roller or cultipacker, refirm the soil, and germinate another batch of weed seeds. By repeating this process, say every 10 days, over a five to six week bare fallow period, we can get several generations of weed seeds out of the surface of the soil. You might think of this as prefer performing a series of stale seed beds, except that instead of doing it right before planting the cash crops, we're doing it a year before production. This gives us a much bigger window for stale seed bedding. It also allows us to match the timing of the bare fallow period with the life cycle of the most pressing weeds. So initially we use a summer fallow like you see here to target warm season weeds like lamb's quarter and pigweed, weeds that require warm soil to germinate. Once we exhausted the seed bank of these warm season weeds, then we shifted the bare fallow period to the start of the growing season to target cool season weeds like chickweed. We hope you'll keep in mind that one reason we may have seen a relatively rapid drop in weed pressure is that we started out with old hay fields where presumably the weed seed bank was relatively low to begin with. On the other hand, these old hay fields were completely infested with quackgrass. Fortunately, it only took one extended summer fallow to get rid of this pernicious perennial weed. We start out by plowing the old sod shallowly in the spring. We want to plow shallow so we can keep those rhizomes near the surface of the soil, so we can use a traditional spring tooth harrow to rip up the sod, bring those rhizomes up on top to dry out in the sun. We typically go over the fallow field with a harrow every two or three weeks, and then often midsummer we switch over to this old riding cultivator, which we've equipped with large tractor sweeps. The sweeps in front are undercutting the weeds and then that small section of flexible pasture harrow in the back is kind of rolling the root systems over, shaking the soil off of the rhizomes so they dehydrate quickly. At the end of the summer, we then seed the fallow field down to a thick stand of rye. This is to start rebuilding soil structure that may have deteriorated over this extended period of tillage and also to set back any remaining quackgrass. We think of the rye as a very effective smother crop, which competes with the weeds both above and below ground. 1999 was the first year of cash crop production in this contour strip, and quackgrass wasn't a problem at all. In fact, overall weed pressure was so low that we never did any hand weeding in this field at all. Now, 99 was virtual drought conditions in our area, and despite that, the crops went on to produce quite well. And weed control was so effective that we actually seeded rye in the pathways for weed control in case we received a heavy downpour. I'm sorry, for, uh, most, for erosion control in case we received a heavy downpour. Taking care of perennial and annual weeds ahead of time 
is even more important in the early spring when you often don't have much time for pre-plant cultivation or stale seed bedding. It's particularly the case with a crop like onions, which are not weed competitive at all. Uh, this slide was taken at uh, the beginning of July, and at this point we hadn't done any hand weeding at all in this half acre field. Now it's important to remember it's the management of the fallow fields on either side of the onions that's providing the weed control, not what we are doing during the cash crop year. Over the years, we've reduced weed pressure to the point where we now routinely use living mulches to protect the soil. In this case, we've seeded a single row of hairy vetch in the middle of the pathways around the 15th of June. And by the beginning of August, the uh, vetch has spread out and provides about 80% soil coverage. This is really a benefit in extremely wet years, like this um, uh, slide taken in 2003 or like this past season. This bioextensive system works well for making it easier to implement uh, cultural practices in the field, whether we're talking about cover cropping or composting or stale seed bedding. But we also think that planting the vegetables every other year can simplify the record keeping and crop rotation planning that takes place in the farm office. So for example, when we bring this onion field back into vegetable production in two years' time, the only thing we need to worry about is not planting anything in the allium family. Okay, no onions, no leeks, no garlic, no shallots. Everything else is fair game. That gives us a lot of options. We could follow the onions two years later, say with a field of lettuce and spinach. Two years after the lettuce and spinach. All we have to think about is not planting anything in the lettuce or spinach family. If we needed to, we could put the field back into onions because now we would have a four year break before alliums had been planted. And that's sort of the minimum uh, break for a horticultural crop rotation. In fact, because the bioextensive market garden spreads out vegetables over time and space, Usually we would not go back into onions. It might be six, eight, or even 10 years before a field would see alliums again. So after the lettuce and onions, we'd probably go into another plant family, like these potatoes. We have to admit that record keeping was much easier during our first years on the farm when we primarily wholesaled all of our produce. That's because we would put a whole field in one plant family, a whole field of onions, whole field of lettuce, whole field of potatoes. Now that our business is almost entirely direct marketing, we grow a much greater diversity of crops in smaller quantities. So instead of a whole field of potatoes, half of it might be early potatoes and the other half garlic, with a few rows of peas thrown in uh, to fill out the field. Or we might have our last planting of carrots, sharing the edge of a field with a couple of rows of leeks. To make matters more complicated, we grow successive plantings of lettuce and spinach all season long, and often we interplant these short-term crops with longer-term vegetables. So our mid-season succession plantings of lettuce and spinach might get interplanted with squash and peas like you see here, or our fall successions of lettuce and spinach often end up in alternating rows with brassicas. Despite the added complexity, rotation planning is still very straightforward. When we bring this field back into production two years, the only thing we need to worry about is not planting a lettuce, spinach, or brassicas. We think this sort of simplicity and flexibility is so essential for small-scale vegetable production because like every grower, we're constantly adapting our cropping plans to changes in the weather and marketplace. Before we look at how mulching, reduced tillage, and season extension can benefit from uh, this land extensive approach to market gardening, we thought we should stop and see if you had any questions or comments about what we've talked about so far. Uh, any questions? Yes. The question was, how large is our farm and who are we marketing to? 
Um, the whole farm is about 89 acres. Uh, 30 of that is in woods, and a lot of it is in pasture. Um, the acreage that we are growing on, there's about seven and a half acres managed for vegetables, and half of that is in vegetables, so three and a half acres, something like that. Um, we now are marketing um, to our closest city is Williamsport. It's a population of about 35,000. Um, we do one market a week, and that basically takes up all the produce that we cannot meet the demand for the produce. Um, at the farmer's market, there's 35 vendors, and it's really very well supported by the local community. Uh, we also do a couple of restaurants, um, three restaurants. We mainly supply them with mesclun, the baby lettuce. And makes it sound so easy. We sell it all at one market in one city. But keep in mind, when we moved to the area, there was almost zero interest in organic or local. We sold a lot of our lettuce, say, through the supermarkets, and it went on the shelf without any label. It's just there with the California lettuce. What was kind of uh, redeeming to us is people would pick it out just on the virtue of how it looked and taste. There was no sort of intellectual data to go with it. Um, but because of that, we, we primarily wholesaled out of the area. A lot of our vegetables, we grew, grew through the co-op TOG. We sold to distributors in Washington, D.C. And, and Philly. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous thinking back on it that three acres of vegetables had to use three major metropolitan areas just to get rid of it. <laughs> and now uh, we can't meet the demand just in Williamsport. It shows how much things have changed. Uh, what percentage of crops do we direct seed and transplant? How much do we do? We uh, transplant uh, every single week about 750 uh, plants of lettuce all season long from April till the middle of August. Um, we direct seed uh, spinach every two weeks throughout the season, um, and we direct seed uh, baby lettuce for masculine every two weeks. Um, and then we do a lot of transplanting of brassicas, um, those kinds of things. We direct seed carrots. Um, potatoes are obviously planted from seed potatoes. Uh, other part of the question? I think it's sort of half and half. Yeah, half and half. Like the other part was was how do we direct seed without irrigation? Is that right? Um, it's a major focus of us. Moisture is the most limiting nutrient on our farm. Now, keep in mind also we're up in the mountains. We have a somewhat cooler climate. We probably have heavy dews longer into the summer than some areas. But almost everything we do is focused on preserving soil moisture and it's not just preserving the total amount of soil moisture, it's preserving it close enough to the surface that we can germinate something like carrots. I mean, we, we got carrot crops this year, even in the middle of the, the drought and heat wave. Um, and I guess, I don't know how many of you are interested in this, but there's several factors to this. Uh, a big one is shallow tillage. We found that we're on a kind of an exposed hilltop site. If we plow or till deeply and we have hot, windy weather, it's going to dry to tillage depth very quickly. You can roll it and try to referm it, but it's never as good as the natural capillary action in the soil. And so by restricting tillage to the top two or three inches of the soil and then referming it, we can keep that moisture up pretty close to the surface. Also, because we're using cover crops for soil building, we want to kill them at least six weeks before planting. Doesn't necessarily mean we till them then, but we want to kill them because the cover crops can take a tremendous amount of moisture out of the soil. You, know, you saw the pictures of the rye and vetch like this. In a dry year, it's going to be bone dry under there. But if we disc that down and create a nice mulch, and we're doing this six weeks before planting, we're bound to get at least one rain. That may not be true any longer, but it's, it's been true up until now. And then all that moisture is going to be held under the mulch and close to the surface of the soil. That's one reason we use the winter kill cover crops before spring planting, because they're already dead going into the spring and they will hold the winter moisture. Um, do we ever chisel plow? Not in the sense of uh, tractor chisel plowing uh, going, you know, whatever, 12 to 16 inches deep. That's 
Possibly you could do one tooth with a team of horses, but it's awful hard to make the next pass amount to anything. Either it's going to slide into that slot or you're going to be three feet away. So you can kind of make rough slits in the soil, but you're not really chisel plowing. We do, uh, I don't know how to explain it, set up cultivators so there might be just uh, widely spaced teeth with sweeps that have kind of a sh shallow chiseling effect. They're kind of loosening and uprooting the soil rather than inverting it with the plow. Yeah. And we'll show you in the second part some of the work we're doing with no-till and ridge-till and other types of minimum tillage. Yeah, great questions. Without rainfall, how are you getting the weed seeds to germinate during the fallow year or fallow time if it's dry? Um, I do think firming the soil makes a huge difference. I mean, it, it makes a difference when seeding cover crops. You know, if you just put them on the surface or just kind of work them in, you're really dependent on a rain for germination. But if you can come back and firm the soil, get better seed to soil contact, uh, the germination of both the weeds and the cover crop are better. Um, and then again here, if you use the same strategy I was talking about to preserve moisture for planting the vegetables, mm -hmm. and you do that for planting the weeds, I know it sounds very <laughs> contradictory, uh, that can help too. But uh, I'm sure. By, by firming the soil, you're, you're having that capillary, you're bringing your moisture up to the surface so that the weeds that are there will germinate. Without cultipacking, that soil stays dry and actually will dry out for a couple of inches or something like that. So your weed seeds tend not to germinate then. But, you know, again, that's just our experience. I think the most important thing is just to observe what works on your farm. And sometimes it will be accidents, you know, like, whoa, why is that field green with weeds? What did, what did I do or not do to get that to happen? Uh, some people are finding that it's for some reason easier to get the weeds germinate if they plant something. I don't know if the weeds know, <laughs> but in other words, you might be more successful doing a quick succession of green manures, you know, several plantings of buckwheat or mustard, and, and you might actually get more weed seeds to germinate than doing what we do with this kind of stale seed bedding. So don't get too stuck in our techniques, just sort of the general approach, I guess. Yeah, great question. Um, he pointed out, he was asking about if, uh, how we are using the rotary hoe with the horses, because it was really invented after tractors came on the scene, going at what, seven, eight miles an hour to pop weeds out of row crops, you know, before the corn is up or shortly after it's up. And uh, I have occasionally taken the horses at a trot with it, but it's, it's not that practical. We are typically actually using that after harrowing, okay? So the spring tooth harrow kind of uproots the weeds, but sometimes there's still a lot of root mass or a soil on the roots and the weeds aren't drying quickly. Taking the rotary hoe just kind of pops those weeds up. They're already loosened. You don't have to go fast to do that. It's the same idea as the one photo where we had the pasture harrow behind the cultivator. Just some way to to make sure you get a quick weed kill because uh, you get a rainy period, you might only have a three-day window to kill your weeds. If all you do is kind of drag them around and let them reroot, you haven't gotten very far. So it's a tool we happen to pick up and we find that it works well for this, but don't feel you have to get a rotary hoe <laughs> to do a summer fallow. Well, I've got one. I haven't found it very useful. Good. Well, maybe for this purpose. Yeah. This slide paints a pretty good picture of two very different aspects of our land extensive approach to market gardening. The one is the alternating fallow year system, which we've already talked about. You can see the fallow field to the left is green with a cover crop, building the soil up for the next year's fall vegetables. On the right is a fallow field in the middle of being stale seed bedded reducing the weed pressure for the next year's spring vegetables. Now the second aspect, second land a extensive aspect, is what's going on in the cash crop field. And you've probably been wondering why we plant all of our crops in these widely spaced rows. Well, that's because we don't have irrigation. 
And we try to give every plant as large a reservoir of soil moisture as possible. And then in dry conditions, we like to mulch the soil to hold in as much of that precious moisture as possible. We typically plant all of our crops in rows that are 32 inches apart. However, this past year, when it was so hot and dry, we actually planted some of our brassicas four feet apart, like you see here. Now, I realize it looks very wet in this photo. I mean, this was after getting record rainfall in September. But when we were planting out the brassicas in July, it was bone dry in our area and a, a heat wave as well. Sometimes you can get into trouble, though, when you're using a straw mulch. For example, the pathway over to the left, we use purchased wheat straw. That nice green carpet is all volunteer wheat. And that set back the yield and the health of the crop. That wasn't the case for the rest of the field, where we used rye straw produced on our farm, which was free of volunteer grain and weed seeds. One of the nice things about the bioextensive layout is we can grow our own mulch right in the market garden. For example, here we're mowing a cover crop of rye in one of the fallow fields. We're going to use it to mulch leeks in the adjacent field to the right. Okay? It's almost hard to get any closer than that for growing your own mulch materials. We let the rye dry for a few days, then we rake it into windrows. This is quick work with the team. However, it is time consuming for the two of us to pick up uh, pieces of these windrows, carry it from the fallow field, and place it in the pathways between the leeks. We began mulching the leeks this past year around June 10th. That's just as we entered a seven week period of very hot and dry weather. The homegrown mulch seemed to hold in enough moisture that the leeks never showed any signs of stress. Zero irrigation, we don't even water in the plants. <clears throat> we started receiving some rainfall in August and cooler temperatures, and the leeks went on to make a, a decent crop. This slide was actually taken right after Tropical Storm Lee, and we were thankful to see a zero a soil washing. The homegrown mulch also made it so much nicer for harvesting, rather than slogging through two months of mud in September and October. The one drawback to that system is we have to carry the windrows to the plants. But when we grow our own mulch for large sprawling vine crops like winter squash, we have a much more labor efficient system. We actually till a strip in the fallow fields for the squash. In this case, the fallow field was planted to rye and clover. We allow the rye to grow until the uh, squash is ready to plant. The rye is about five to six feet tall and dropping pollen. We mow it at this time, and then we rake a big windrow of straw, straw right next to the squash, which has been direct seeded under the row cover. This is labor efficient. It only takes a few rounds with a hay rake and about 10 minutes of our time to arrange the straw next to the squash. It's also relatively land efficient. By that I mean it only takes a 12 foot wide strip of rye to produce a significant straw mulch adequate to hold moisture all summer long. We direct seed three different types of winter squash, um, delicata, butternut, and a red kabocha. As soon as we seed it, we cover it with a floating row cover. The row cover helps to enhance the growing conditions in our cool climate by raising the soil and the air temperature. It also acts as an insect barrier, preventing cucumber beetles from attacking the crop and eventually affecting it with bacterial wilt. As soon as the squash is blossoming, we take the row cover off so that the bees can pollinate it. Now, this slide was taken in the summer, very hot summer of uh, 2007. In fact, the clover that is planted in the rye stubble basically stopped growing until we received rain again toward the end of the summer. But the winter squash never showed any signs of stress and went on to produce quite a good crop. Using the rye mulch um, has actually doubled our yields compared to previous years under similar dry conditions. And under wet conditions, the rye mulch helps to keep the uh, fruit 
uh, clean and disease-free, greatly reducing the time spent cleaning and then also improving the storage quality of the winter squash. Uh, using the fallow year uh, to grow this winter squash and the rye mulch as well as the uh, clover allows us to uh, have a little more income in that fallow field, but also still, still realize the basic good soil building qualities of the cover crop. Raking the rye straw right next to the uh, squash is a real labor saver, but we've found that the most efficient way to grow our own mulch is to plant the vegetables directly into the cover crops. Unfortunately, due to our cool, uh, wet climate, the only vegetables that work in a strictly no-till scenario for us are the allium family. And garlic in particular seems to thrive. It likes the cool, wet conditions under the cover crop mulch. We do like to roll down the cover crop of oats and peas before planting. We aren't really trying to kill it. I mean, after all, these uh, cover crops will die back naturally over winter. We just want to flatten the cover crop sufficiently so we can get in the field and mark a no-till planting furrow. We're using one of our old horse-drawn riding cultivators for this purpose. Uh, it's equipped with a coulter in the front that's slicing through the cover crop residue. And then there's a narrow tooth in the back that's opening up a slit in the soil just large enough for hand setting the garlic cloves. Another reason to roll down the cover crop is to make planting easier. Otherwise, we'd have to wade through the waist-high top growth of oats and peas. One advantage to working with a live cover crop is the root system is taking up the surplus soil moisture. In this particular year, it was way too wet and muddy to plant garlic in a clean-tilled field at this time. Also over winter, as the cover crop dies back, the root system stays intact, and it prevents the garlic cloves from heaving. The cover crop residues decompose fairly quickly in the spring, so we find it necessary to add some additional straw mulch just in the pathways to preserve uh, moisture all season. And we find that this is essential in a no-till system like this for consistently getting uh, good-sized garlic bulbs without irrigation. Up close, you might be able to see the cover crop mulch remaining around the base of the garlic, and then the straw mulch that's been added in the pathways. You may also notice that the garlic is growing up on a, a low ridge. And this little bit of elevation we think is really necessary for a no-till system in our area. It provides that little bit of added soil warming, aeration, and drainage uh, to get consistent results. But the real key to getting consistent results with a no-till system is bringing the weeds control under control and building the weeds up before no-till planting the garlic. So we're beginning in the fallow year. We're incorporating the first cover crop before any weeds have a chance to set seed. We're initiating this bare fallow period to reduce the weed seed bank in the surface of the soil. At the end of the summer fallow, we apply a light application of compost uh, before seeding uh, the cover crops of oats and peas on ridges. And this usually takes place around the first or second week of August. Before building the ridges, we broadcast the cover crop seed over the field. We then build the ridges with these disc killers that are attached to the cultivator. So on one pass, we're covering the seed and we're building the ridges. We follow right behind with this cultipacker that firms the soil so we get better soil to seed contact. The roller also um, levels the ridges so that we end up with mini raised beds that makes planting the following spring much easier than trying to plant on a steep ridge top. Nine days later, you can see the oats coming up on the ridges. Because the disc killers concentrate all of the oats onto the ridges, you'll also notice that we've seeded a single row of oats in the middle of the pathway for added soil protection. We just use a rock behind seeder for this job. By the third week of September, the oats have completely filled in the field. Um, this is this past season, 
and uh, we received record, uh, I think it was over 12 inches of rain through the month of September, and when there was absolutely no evidence of soil erosion, even though at times there was water running around and over our fields. Just as important is the cover crop ridges create ideal conditions of uh, warmth and aeration for soil building. Digging into the ridge, you can see there's a nice crumb structure developing as a result of the cover crop's root system, and also the soil life working on the decomposing organic matter from the previous cover crop. It's important to build the soil biologically ahead of time because we won't have a chance to do intensive tillage the following spring in order to create a seed bed. Uh, a month later, uh, the oats have basically doubled in size. Uh, this is the point where we would uh, flatten down the cover crop and plant the garlic. However, for uh, early spring plantings, we allow the oats to die back naturally over winter. Uh, No-tilling works well, uh, planting into this uh, dead oats uh, for crops like onion sets, shallots, or flower bulbs. But for uh, direct seeding or transplanting, we find it's necessary to lightly till the ridge tops. The best way we found to do this is to go over the field and chop up the dead oats into small pieces using this custom-built uh, residue cutter. It's just a series of coulters attached to a uh, axle. We then go over the field a couple of times with a rotary hoe. It does a good job of loosening and crumbling up the, soil, uh, the surface of the soil, which can sometimes form a crust over winter. Um, it also, the other benefit of the uh, rotary hoe is that loosened up soil um, makes all the difference in maintaining moisture and holding it until we're ready to plant. Another benefit of the rotary hoe is it sheds a lot of that residue into the valleys without breaking down the ridge top. Um, what we end up with is a nice mulch pathway and then a narrow bed of clean soil on top of the ridge for planting. For transplanting, we just mark a, right, a, a, mark a row right up on top of the, of the ridge top, and the soil conditions are just plant, perfect for hand planting. The only tillage that we've done is rotary hoe a couple of times, only going an inch or two deep. And um, we just really feel this form, of, uh, this form of minimum tillage is a great way to maintain soil structure as well as soil moisture. It also works well for direct seeded early planted crops like uh, spinach or cutting lettuce. But again, we need to emphasize how critical the fallow year of um, soil building and weed management is to make a, a system like this uh, minimum tillage work for us and to be dependable and productive. We should also point out that the residue that's shed into the pathways provides adequate mulch um, for early planted short-term crops. But for longer-term crops like the garlic, it is necessary to mulch the pathways to maintain soil moisture all season long. I suppose it goes without saying that a mulch made from winter-killed cover crop residues wouldn't last long enough for fall crops planted out mid-summer. If we're facing dry conditions, then we'd apply a straw mulch in the pathways like we showed you earlier. But if soil moisture is plentiful, then we're more inclined to use a living mulch. In this case, we've seeded a single row of hairy vetch in the pathways between these alternating rows of brassicas and lettuce. We typically interseed the vetch about a month after transplanting the cash crops. Again, we just do this with a walk-behind seeder. This is so much faster and easier than applying a straw mulch by hand. By the time harvest is in full swing, we usually have a nice carpet of vetch covering the pathway. This is good for soil protection on a sloping field like you see here. I don't want to give you the impression that a living mulch will hold moisture the same way that a straw mulch does. But what we like about this single row interseeding system is the roots of the vetch are concentrated in the middle of the pathway. So they're not likely to compete with the cash crop for moisture or nutrients. Over winter, the vetch kind of withers back and then it starts growing again in the spring. And we have two options here as we begin the fallow year. If the field has a lot of winter weeds in it, we will turn under the vetch and begin a bare fallow period to target cool season weeds. 
But if weed pressure is low, like in this field, then we just lightly till the bed tops, get rid of the smattering of weeds that are there, and work in uh, the residue from the previous year's cash crops. Now, I know most of you are probably thinking this looks really strange to see a cover crop planted in rows. But why wouldn't the vetch benefit from the widely spaced rows, just like the vegetables? This was one month later. <clears throat> the vetch is completely filled in the field. These slides were taken during uh, the dry conditions in the spring of 2010, and yet it doesn't look like it's having any trouble finding adequate moisture. Another month later, the biomass has doubled again in size. This is the perfect time to kill or incorporate the vetch because it's really maximized its nitrogen and biomass production, and yet uh, it hasn't produced viable seed. What you can't tell from the edge of the field is how thick and long those single rows of vetch vines have grown. So what started out as just a living mulch to protect the pathways of fall vegetables has now turned into a significant soil building cover crop at the start of the fallow year. At this point, we thought you might like a little change of pace and see how these bioextensive principles apply to season extension. We've located all of our high tunnels in the gardens down by our house. That's primarily because we have a source of irrigation there and it's, it's really a must to irrigate under protection like this. Also, this site is more protected from the wind than up in our vegetable fields on the top of the hill. And it's much handier for monitoring and venting the hoop houses uh, in close proximity to our house. This slide of one of the house gardens in the fall gives you a pretty good idea of, of what the bioextensive management looks like in this case. You can see how the high tunnels uh, alternate with fallow lands. In this case, the fallow lands are green with a cover crop of clover. We've intentionally built these hoop houses so the two of us can take them apart and move them with the rotation. So this way, the hoop house vegetables can also benefit from a fallow year of weed control and soil building. For instance, in this fallow patch, we're preparing for hoop house production the next year. We're turning under a cover crop of rye before any weeds can go to seed. We're initiating a series of stale seed beds to reduce the number of weed seeds in the soil. And then at the end of this summer fallow, we seed the fallow patch down to a cover crop of peas. In this case, it's actually a mix of field peas and cow peas planted the end of July. That extra early planting date uh, means they put on their biomass early, and they also die back early as well, generally with the first high, hard freeze. So already, by the time uh, Thanksgiving comes around, we're able to move the hoop houses directly on top of the dead pea mulch. This way, we're ready to go the next spring uh, for early production. We also want to point out that moving the tunnels is not only good for weed control and soil building, but we also avoid the buildup of nitrates and salts that can sometimes develop in permanent structures. Uh, to move the hoop houses, we just carry over the 4x4 four four sill beams and place them 12 feet apart. We then drive rebar down in holes that had been drilled into the sill beams. The 20 inch rebar is easy to get in and get out, but at the same time it anchors the, anchors the structure enough so that it doesn't fly away in a stiff wind. We leave about four inches of rebar sticking up above the sill beam and then just slip the hoop over the top. We carry the uh, hoops over um, in 20 foot sections, leaving the ridge pole attached, and then just reconnect them at the top with a coupler. What we end up with is a 12 by 60 foot hoop house that took us a couple of hours to move and the cost of the materials are under $300. The following spring, the dead oats is really easy to rake off, exposing a nice mellow soil. We rake the, um, oat, or the um, pea mulch outside of the uh, sill beams so that to mulch the pathways so it protects the soil from the runoff from the hoop house. We then put the greenhouse plastic on apply a little compost, lightly till the soil, and we're ready to plant. 
And even in our cool climate, we're usually ready to harvest greens by the beginning of May. Whether it's intensively planted hoop house production or dry land vegetables in the field, taking land out of production just makes it so much easier for us to implement good farming practices. If you're interested in more uh, details on this system, we put together a booklet of articles and a DVD, which you can use for review. I believe they're on sale at the PASA booth, and a percentage of those sales go to support the organization. Uh, you can also order them from us uh, through the address in the back of your brochure. But I think most importantly, we'd like to see if you have any more questions or com comments. Do we have a few more minutes, Dave? Yeah, we're good for about 10 minutes. About 10 minutes, great. Yeah. Uh, also, most of you have picked up a small farmer's journal, but there are some in the back that the uh, publication they sent us these boxes to give away as gifts for you. So if each one of you want a, a small farmer's journal, you're welcome to it. How long do we get out of the 4 by 4 sill beams? Uh, we are using inexpensive hemlock lumber, which holds up reasonably well, but I would say they last anywhere from five to eight years. Okay, and they're very, it's a soft wood, so it's easy to work with. If you had cedar or something available, it'd probably last a long time. The question was, uh, share our experience with tillage radish. Um, I think the expert is here, is Charlie White here. He's, he's running trials on the tillage radish, but we do have a, a trial out this fall uh, using the tillage radish in our ridge till system. Now, I should actually say we tried this, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago, seeding the tillage radish in the valley and then oats on the ridge. And the idea there is, you know, the tillage radish makes this big, long root. And when it decomposes, it leaves holes in the soil. And we thought, well, in the spring, any water running, excuse me, off the ridges would just go down those holes <laughs> instead of running off the field. Um, it actually wasn't as good as an oat cover, okay, because the, the tillage radish suppressed the oats in the valleys, and once they decomposed, we basically ended up with a bare valley and protection on the ridge top. This year, we reversed it. We had the tillage radish on the top of the ridge and the oats protecting the pathway, and we're very excited to see if that will um, give us, you know, a chance to get in and no-till plant as early as possible and get some good nitrogen release. Uh, one observation that we made, uh, just yesterday we were up in the fields with a shovel just looking at crumb structure. This is what we do for entertainment. And um, the oats and the clover had a very nice crumb structure, but I hate to say is the, um, the tillage radish was a very dense soil. Um, so there's not that kind of, you know, little root system all over building up the crumb structure at this point. So it'll be very interesting to see how things do in the spring. Yeah, it's a good question about integrating the, the animals in the rotation. We um, do not pasture the horses. And there's two reasons for that. Well, I guess there's three. Um, they're fairly big animals, so if they're out there in wet weather, they could cause some compaction. Um, they also have a tendency of concentrating their dung in certain areas. So you're going to sort of concentrate the fertility of the field in certain spots. You know, sheep would be much more applicable from that point of view. Um, and the other is, is mainly logistical. Our barn is at the bottom of the hill. We would have to run laneways all the way up to the top through the, our deer fence, <laughs> around the roads to each cover crop strip. So it, you know, if we were desperate for pasture, yes, but we have so much hillside pasture for the horses, it's just not worth fooling with it. But we do know, uh, of farmers who are using sheep in this bioextensive layout and also uh, pastured poultry. And uh, we used, as you saw on the one slide, uh, pastured poultry for quite a few years. Our interest was in using them for getting out slugs and grubs because we're using all of this cover crop mulch. We're creating good habitat for those kinds of bugs. But again, it's sort of a logistical thing to let them out every morning, close them up every night, and it's not in close proximity to the house. The, the question's about the record rainfall this past year, and 
We did not get as much as some areas. I know uh, some areas had double the amount of rainfall that we had. Yeah. Yeah, we had seven and a half inches in a week's time, uh, where people just south of us had 14. Um, also, the way our farm is laid out, it's up on top of a hill, and if we flood, everybody's underwater. <laughs> um, but you know, seven and a half inches of rain is, is seven and a half. You know, it's a lot. It was a lot, um, and because we do so much cover cropping and mulching of our pathways. I mean, for 25 years, we have been really concerned about soil moving. You know, that is a big focus of us. So we have those systems in place so that we, you know, we didn't see, you know, there was a little bit of running. I mean, because our fields aren't perfectly level. So you'd have, you know, even a little bit of washing on a cover crop that came off the field. But there was virtually no soil erosion. We did have some disease issues. Um, in our vegetables. I mean, I've never seen this before. Um, we had, we grow, I don't know how many varieties of lettuce, and I would say 90% of them rotted in, the, in a two week period. I mean, they just turned black. Um, they look perfect, and two days later, they're gone. Yeah, the question is have we seen a buildup in slugs with a minimum tillage? And um, I mean, it's always hard to know what's going on with the bugs, but I, I do think it can aggravate it. And what we've noticed is that it takes one wet period to kind of build up the initial slug population, and then another wet period for them to hatch out a gazillion eggs. <laughs> so if you have a, a wet spring and a wet fall, you're asking for trouble. Uh, one or the other isn't too bad. And th we would aggravate it if we, in our fallow year, did minimum tillage. In other words, we had a lot of cover crop mulch on the surface of the fallow year and then did that again in the following cash crop year. So we've kind of backed off on doing that. And the other reason we've switched from a summer fallow to a spring fallow is that seems to set back those kinds of insects. A summer fallow, they're kind of in their summer hibernation, you might want to say anyway, but uh, a spring fallow is, is harder on them. So, great question. Well, thank you so much. This is. Uh,